afternoon. Um, thank you for attending this city council hearing. My name is city Councilor Ed Flynn, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Veterans and Military Affairs. Today we are having a hearing on docket 0579, a hearing to discuss resources available through Boston's veteran services during COVID-19 pandemic. I sponsored this hearing and it's referred now to, the, to this committee. Um, I wanna thank the panelists for being here today. I also wanna thank my colleagues for attending as well. I will first let the panelists speak first and I'll ask them to talk about their work and what they are seeing as the needs for our veterans and our military families. And then I will ask my colleagues to ask questions and, um, and we'll also take public testimony as well. Um, the panelists that I have so far um, that are with us now are um, from the city of Boston, Commissioner Rob Santiago, Tom Lyons, who is the former deputy commissioner for the city of Boston veterans, and is also active in veterans affairs throughout the state and, and, and the founder of the South Boston Vietnam Veterans Memorial Committee. Coleman, Coleman Nee, who is a, an officer with the Dis Disabled American Veterans National Officer, is also the former secretary for the state agency, uh, Veterans Services. We have Carolyn Mason Hooley, who is the Women's Veterans Program Manager at the VA. We also extended an invitation to Andy McCauley, who's the CEO of the New England Center for um, and Home for Veterans. At this time, I'd like to, I also see Brian Bishop there as well. At this time, and Brian's the Deputy Commissioner, at this time I would like to ask Rob Santiago if he can give us an overview of what he sees from his experience as the Commissioner during this pandemic and what services we're focused on in trying to help our veterans and our military families as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Council Flynn. Uh, good afternoon, Council Flynn, members of the Boston City Council, colleagues and uh, fellow Bostonians. Council Flynn, first, thank you for setting up this call to discuss what is available for our veterans and their family during these very uncertain times. As we all know, our, mili our military and veterans have always answered the call in times of crisis and uncertainty. They have left their families to face the enemy, seen and unseen. They have given their blood, sweat, and tears, and even their lives to protect our freedom and our way of life. When there was a need, they answered the call. Now it is incumbent upon us to return the call in their time of need. During this global pandemic, we will continue to serve all our veterans. The Boston Office of Veteran Services has been working at 100% operational capacity since our contingency plan has been active. Our office has been in constant contact with local, state, federal, and nonprofit organizations, some of which are here on this call today. This is to ensure that our veterans and their families are taken care of and to be there to help alleviate any fears and anxiety associated with this unprecedented time in our history. I also want to thank my staff at Veteran Services. They have seriously stepped up to the challenges of working remotely. I can confidently say that we have not skipped a beat in providing services and administering the benefits our veterans and their families have earned. Our financial assistance program, Mass General Law Chapter 115, has seen a moderate increase with 262 inquiries thus far and yielding 27 new cases that have uh, been submitted to the state for processing. With the current increase in unemployment, we expect these numbers to grow. At this time, we are only requiring a valid DD-214, which is a military discharge paper, and the Boston residency verification. Once normal operations resume, we will be requiring those applicants to provide all documentations for verification and final eligibility for Chapter 115. Here in Boston, we have made it easier for our veterans and their families to apply. We have generated an online application that can be accessed via our website at uh, boston.gov slash veterans for those that are seeking to apply for Chapter 115. We will also assist veterans and their families who do not meet the criteria for Chapter 115. A need must be proven and each application will be handled on a case by case basis. 
For our current clients, our veterans benefit specialists are making regular calls to check in on them and to ensure that they are okay. This includes asking about food and medical prescription access and any vulnerable veterans who may be ill and in need of assistance. To date, we have had 11 food inquiries as we work with volunteer organizations at local food pantries and food banks to make sure those veterans receive their food items. As for our volunteer force, we have had more than 600 in and around Boston sign up to be volunteers to assist veterans and their families. The search, the surge in volunteerism came from the implementation of our pen pal and buddy program. To date, we have matched more than 250 volunteer pen pals to veterans in the hope of ensuring that our veterans don't feel isolated and lonely. This also creates a conduit for our office to maintain awareness of potential issues among our veterans and their families. We are proud of our continued working relationships with our veteran services organizations and nonprofit providers. This, is, this works to bridge the gap between our veterans and their needs. We thank the New England Center and Home for Veterans, Disabled American Veterans, Veterans Legal Services, VA Boston Healthcare System, just to name a few. These dedicated individuals are on the front lines working tirelessly to ensure our veterans and their families remain healthy and are taken care of, especially during this crisis. Finally, yesterday we mobilized Bostonians to honor the service of a World War II veteran and Purple Heart recipient, Octavio Cerullo, who celebrated his 99th birthday. This is at the heart of what we as a department and veterans community do to honor service. It was heartwarming to witness the Boston community coming together. This outpouring of support let us all know that we are not alone and we will get through this together as a city. You can rest assured know that our office is prepared and engaged to guarantee our veterans and their families are taken care of and their service and sacrifices are continuously recognized. They deserve, they serve us and we will continue to serve them. Again, Councilor Flynn and Boston City Council members, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Santiago. And before we go on to the next panelist, I'd also like to recognize the recognize my colleagues that are here with us, Councilor Flaherty, um, Councilor Kenzie Bach, Councilor Andrea Campbell, and Councilor Anissa Asabi George as well. If there are other city councils, I will also mention them um, after the next panelist. Um, at, and the council president is Kim Janey, is also here with us. At this time, I would like to ask Tom Lyons, the former deputy commissioner for the city of Boston, um, a leader in veterans across the state, um, to give an update on what he's seeing maybe at the state and federal level as it impacts our veterans and our military families. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Councillor Flynn and uh, the commissioner and other councillors and the people on the panel. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Councillor, to at least uh, share uh, a little bit about what's, what I see uh, has been going on um, in, in Boston and across the Commonwealth. First, let me commend um, the commissioner for uh, the job that he's doing uh, and his staff are doing during these difficult times. The flexibility uh, to be able to uh, take more veterans on, particularly with the Chapter 115 program is really, really critical at this time. And the, the uh, outreach that has been going on, particularly with our veterans who may be alone in, in, in an apartment or maybe uh, alone at a nursing home. Um, I think, as you know, a counselor. I'm chairman of the board of trustees at the Chelsea Soldiers Home. And, and we have seen firsthand the isolation and sometimes the depression uh, that the veterans are going through right now uh, in terms of uh, not having contact with family. Uh, I'm also on the board of Bright Marine and, and uh, I'm proud to say that Bright Marine provided 25 iPads to Superintendent Poppy uh, and the folks at the soldiers home. So those veterans who are not only in the dorms, but in the long-term care facility over there, uh, have the ability to make connection with their families. Uh, it struck me when I heard the stories of uh, veterans who are in long-term care 
uh, who, who are dying alone. And I know, uh, you know I speak for um, all the veterans out there to, to know that we have a veteran uh, who, who is going uh, through a difficult time and, and is about to pass and, and don't have the ability or, or, or the option of being able to say goodbye to his family is, is really heartbreaking. And so I guess my, my, uh, my challenge, I think, uh, would be to folks if, if they know of a veteran, not just uh, at, at the Chelsea Soldiers Home, but even uh, in a nursing home, uh, if they could uh, think about finding ways to get them connected uh, with their families uh, during the, this dif difficult time, it certainly would, would be uh, a, a blessing uh, to that individual. I think uh, the VA uh, is, is, has opened up a lot of beds. I know we have unfortunately have lost uh, 17 veterans uh, to the COVID-19 uh, outbreak uh, and several were sent to uh, the VA hospital in West Roxbury for, for medical care. So they've been very responsive to us when we had to uh, have a veteran, a veteran transported from the Chelsea Soldiers Home over to um, the VA facility. Uh, so uh, as much as we have had, had all the protocols in place uh, prior to uh, this pandemic, um, I think everybody would agree that um, nursing homes, soldiers homes, and other facilities where you have a large group of people, um, uh, you can have all the protocols in place, but once it gets in, it really just, um, creates havoc for all the residents in that facility. Uh, so that's got kind of where I'm at. Uh, you know, again, I would just encourage people if they know a veteran who particularly is alone, uh, reach out, make sure they're okay, uh, and, and just find, find ways to connect with our veterans. Thank you, Tom. And at this time, I'd like to ask Coleman Nee, who's a national officer with the disabled American veterans and a former secretary at the state level um, to give an overview of what he sees coming out of Washington. Um, what can we expect Coleman as this covert 19 continues and what impact will it have on veterans and military families? Thank you very much, Councillor Flynn. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to the other councillors on, uh, on the call here in the panel. Thank you so much. And uh, to my fellow uh, veterans advocates, um, and it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, again, you know, as a proud member of uh, John F. Kennedy Chapter 3 at the DAV and, uh, and a serving member of the uh, National Interim Legislative Committee, uh, it's a real honor to uh, talk a little bit about what DAV is doing and, and, and some of the coordination we've had, as well as uh, some of the work we've done at the national level. Um, uh, first off, uh, I know that uh, Commissioner Santiago talked about chapter, uh, uh, Mass General Law Chapter 115 benefits, um, but they really are a critical lifeline for many of our veterans and families. And I would uh, encourage all of the counselors, uh, please get the word out uh, to your uh, constituents um, whether or not uh, they served uh, uh, in wartime or during peacetime, uh, as long as uh, they are uh, uh, have a uh, uh, condition, a uh, uh, discharge that's uh, under honorable conditions or, or honorable conditions, served in the military, or their spouse or their the child of a dependent who served in the military, whether or not the actual spouse is still alive or not. So if it's a widow or a widower, someone who uh, uh, was married to someone who at one point served the United States military, uh, please contact uh, uh, Commissioner Santiago's office. It's a, it's a very uh, um, you know, comprehensive benefit that, that they offer over there and, and it can help a lot of people during these difficult times. And I just really want to thank uh, you know, the, the, you know, the mayor, his administration, and in particular the commissioner and, and his staff. I see uh, Deputy Secretary Bishop on the line here as well too. Uh, how they responded during this crisis, just to re-echo uh, what Tom, uh, Tom talked about, that uh, the flexibility and the outreach has really been outstanding. Um, you know, DEV, uh, we are celebrating 100 years of advocacy and comradeship this year, uh, as, we've, uh, as we've done throughout our history as a congressionally chartered organization. Uh, we stand ready to assist veterans and, and their families, especially those that have been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Uh, in fact, just this month, DAV was at the forefront nationally uh, of getting the federal government to correct a huge oversight in the, uh, in the recent plan to pay economic stimulus checks of $1,200 a month to, uh, to individuals in uh, middle to low income. Uh, you know, what, what we noticed uh, when this plan first came out is that many veterans, uh, you know, while many veterans have submitted tax returns for 2018 or 2019, have already received their economic impact checks, depending on their income, uh, payments for some disabled veterans who don't typically file taxes were left out and uh, would have uh, would have gone without. Uh, uh, these are very low income veterans uh, sustaining themselves mostly on uh, VA benefits and maybe a little bit of Social Security. So on April 17th, uh, through DAV's leadership, the Department of Veterans Affairs announced an agreement to work directly with the IRS and the U.S. Treasury Department. So there would be no additional paperwork for these veterans to file and ensure delivery of checks uh, by jointly uh, identifying eligible veterans and their beneficiaries who may have been left out of the initial waves of funds. So for single veterans who haven't filed uh, tax returns, who receive VA compensation, uh, no additional actions required, but veterans in your community that uh, have dependents uh, will be required to update their information with the IRS to receive the, uh, the extra money. And, and individuals interested in, uh, in that can, uh, can uh, please uh, go online to uh, dav.org backslash COVID, and uh, and we have more information there on how they can uh, how they can do that. Uh, I mean, let's just be clear: this devastation caused by COVID nineteen is catastrophic. Um, you know, veterans with disabilities are disproportionately more vulnerable to the impact of this. Uh, there's four point seven million disabled veterans nationwide. Uh, this creates a unique set of challenges to uh, individuals with service connected illnesses and place many of our individuals in higher risk categories now, especially with uh, the prospect that they're facing a di dire financial situation. But there is help. Uh, in addition to uh, resources from the federal government as well as uh, city and state, uh, DAV did announce uh, an unprecedented event to uh, help uh, veterans through a COVID-19 relief fund. Uh, veterans that uh, have a service-connected disability who have uh, found themselves unemployed or in financial straits can go to dav.org backslash COVID relief and apply for a grant of $250. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit, I know it's not a lot, but it's something, $250 means something to someone who doesn't have any income coming in the door. And uh, you know the, it, they're gonna keep doing it until the funds run out. You just need to be a service connected disabled veteran. You do not have to be a member of DAV in order to obtain this. Uh, in addition, uh, our benefit specialists are all working uh, for uh, handling claims. If you are a veteran who believes that you have a service-connected disability, that you may have had an injury or some type of medical issue that occurred or was exacerbated by, exacerbated by your military service, I ask you to go on uh, benefitsquestions.org, uh, contact the DAV, let us help, uh, let us help you file a service-connected claim uh, and get you, uh, get you the needed income uh, and benefits and services and health care services that you're eligible for. Uh, also, if you have a claim and you think that that's somehow been worsened or you've noticed uh, uh, issues with that or additional uh, additional medical issues, please uh, contact the same service uh, 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 national service officers. We want to we want to help you and we want to help get your claim where it should be. Uh, on May 19th, uh, DAV is hosting a national virtual job fair from noon to four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. This is in partnership with Recruit Military. Uh, there are companies that are still hiring and are looking for veterans. We encourage people to uh, go to DAV uh, and to jobs.dav.org uh, and they can register for that. There's also uh, uh, numerous uh, virtual job fairs uh, going in, uh, in and around um, the country. Uh, in Boston, we'll have one, I believe, coming up on August 20th. Um, finally, Really, on behalf of DAV, I'd like to thank and recognize the real heroes of this crisis, uh, our first responders and our healthcare workers. Uh, Boston is suffering, but we have demonstrated that we're capable of meeting the challenge through the strength of our people that are on the front lines. Many of these workers began their careers and received their training in the United States military. So thanks to the many veterans and family members that are currently serving in the Guard and, and Reserves, that are in our first responder and public safety rank. I think Boston has distinguished itself as a leader during these terrible days. And large part of that is to those who did and still wear the uniform of this nation. 
and for their families. So again, thank you. Uh, to answer any questions, Councillor, and thank you to the council for your uh, in total for your leadership on this issue and for uh, thinking about veterans during this difficult time. Thank you, thank you, Coleman. And um, I'm not sure if Carolyn Mason Hooley is on. Um, on she's with the Women Veterans Outreach Program at the VA. Um, is Carolyn on? Doesn't appear that Carolyn's on right now. Um, if she calls in, we will. It, we will it looks like she's in. She's, she's just, she hasn't unmuted. Oh, okay. Hi, Carolyn. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, okay. Carolyn. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we, we wanted to ask you, and first of all, thank you for the incredible work that you're doing and the VA is doing. Um, can you give us a, an update on um, the women's outreach program? What impact this coronavirus is having on women veterans? I will. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Carolyn Mason Wally. I am the Woman Veterans Program Manager at VA Boston. Um, and I want to say thank you to Councilor Flynn and to all the council members, um, community partners, and citizens of Boston that are joining us. Um, in my position at VA Boston, my role is to be an advocate and, and oversee the services that we provide for women. Um, I think, though, that my message is um, a little bit broader than that, and I can go into specifics for women veterans. Um, but the, the message as a whole is that VA continues to provide care to women, um, to veterans, both inpatient and outpatient. Um, as we know, we have changed the way that we do business by um, drastically transforming much of our outpatient care to the use of video and telephone care. Our care to women veterans has, um, at this time, has continued in that vein. Um, our teams, both in uh, primary care and many of our specialty services, mental health, um, gynecology, medical and um, surgical services has transformed to video um, visits and telephone care. Um, our inpatient have been transformed to prepare for the surge. We have developed um, plans and units to care for COVID positive patients in many of our specialties, mental health, community living centers, SCI, um, spinal cord injury, our inpatient medical um, emergency care and ICU level care. We've developed some innovative care in, um, um, services, including printing our own swabs using a 3D printer, making our own hand sanitizer, using grant, grant funds to, um, to utilize Uber and Lyft to deliver meals, purchasing iPads for inpatients in our um, various units to connect with family and friends. Our women veterans issues that we're seeing um, in this pandemic really are rather unique. Um, first of all, how do we navigate um, pregnancy during a pandemic? How do you um, confirm pregnancy, refer to care for maternity care, deal with the deliveries in hospitals where women are rather afraid to go because of the COVID outbreak and then provide um, support after the delivery. Our maternity care coordination program here in Vision One in New England has um, reached out to all of our patients who are currently either pregnancy, uh, pregnant or postpartum, making sure that they know that we are still here, that we are still helping to navigate the system, particularly in this awfully scary time. Our intimate partner violence program has stepped up services and outreach to uh, both men and women who may be living in violent, um, in violent homes, particularly um, during this time of quarantining, stay-at-home orders, 
um, the concern for these veterans is really heightened. And this goes beyond the veteran community as well. We're seeing great, um, greatly increased symptoms in veterans who are experiencing mental health issues. Um, our mental health teams have stepped up their both video and telephone visits to provide care, as well as utilizing some of the, um, the apps that have been developed by VA to um, bring such practices as yoga, meditation, Tai Chi, and other wellness services to veterans to help calm fears and deal with anxiety. Finally, we, we remain ready to service all veterans that may need their help. We urge veterans to call us via our patient call center, 1-800-865-3384, and ask for guidance prior to arriving and entering our facility. Our teams are very um, actively answering secure messages as well and um, ordering testing based on symptoms, exposures, and other criteria. Our VA continues to um, maintain readiness to develop, to offer our fourth mission to extend our services in times of war, terrorism, and national emergencies. To continue support to our veterans as well as to support national, state, and local emergency management and public health officials. We are here for all veterans and thank you for your service and thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you for being on this call with us. Um, at this time, I would like to ask my city council colleagues if they would like to speak um, give an opening statement and kind of weave that in with a, a question for the panelists. And then we could also take it, take it up for um, additional follow-up from the, from, the, um, from the public as well. Um, the first person I had that came on the call was Councilor Michael Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to you, obviously, for hosting the hearing also as the lead sponsor and uh, I recognize uh, all the folks that uh, are um, are on this hearing and also uh, thank them for all their great work in their um, respective um, um, roles and categories. Uh, I know that um, they know, and I can speak on behalf of all the Boston City Council colleagues here, um, and uh, that the work that, that Ed Flynn does on behalf of veterans uh, on the council, it's unmatched uh, during my tenure on the council as the longest serving member of the city council. Um, uh, his advocacy on behalf of uh, the men and women that serve our country and their families uh, speaks for itself. And obviously it's a great asset that we as a council have in Council of Flynn, but I think all of you know his great work uh, and attention to detail uh, in this space. So we're, uh, we're proud and happy to have him as our colleague on the council, uh, keeping us abreast of what's happening uh, with respect to our veterans. And uh, uh, I know I am, and I know I think I speak for all my colleagues where we're ready and available to jump in behind Ed anytime he needs us on veterans issues. So, um, and this is obviously an interesting time for us. Um, you know, our veterans and their families who have served our country and have made those sacrifices, they deserve access to uh, coordinated resource, uh, resources, not only year round, but especially now during the COVID-19 and whether that's through uh, housing um, insecurity or food insecurity, um, the need to get tested, the need to maybe potentially get retested. Uh, our small business owners, I mean, uh, our veterans um, make up, uh, you know, uh, every facet uh, of our city. Uh, and it's through their great contributions that uh, we are the great city that we are. So um, if we should be helping uh, folks, uh, it should be our veterans. I know that, uh, and I can see our commissioner, um, Commissioner Rob Santiago is with us and uh, he cares deeply about uh, fellow veterans. He's doing a phenomenal job on behalf of our veterans. Uh, alongside of, uh, of our other leaders that we have here, uh, Komeni and uh, Tommy Lyons, they kind of summed it up best in their opening remarks as well. So uh, I'm here to uh, to listen uh, to what some of those concerns are, see if we do have situations where we need to be doing more in line of uh, food distribution, uh, housing, uh, financial services, uh, rent and mortgage relief, uh, uh, business uh, support, all the things that we're doing um, 
currently in response to uh, our COVID-19 response to our residents. We need to make sure that our veterans are included in that. So uh, anything I can do to help um, and to support uh, Chairman Flynn, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, first in line along with my colleagues in making sure that um, you know we better understand uh, the resources that are available uh, right now for our veterans. We also want to identify any gaps that may exist uh, for, for, uh, for veterans in their families. And so uh, I look forward to hearing more of the testimony and want to thank uh, everyone for participating, but also thank you for all the, for the great work that you all do in your respective capacities to help our veterans, to help uh, our veterans' families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Flaherty. And um, the next city council that was on the line was Councilor Kenzie Block. I think she stepped off um, for, for a bit. So I'm gonna go to um, Councilor Campbell. If Councilor Campbell is on. Hi, can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank Th you for being with us, Councilor. Oh, thank you so much, Councilor Flynn. I was having such issues. I kept getting booted out for some reason. Um, but thank you for your leadership as always on these issues. I know for you it's personal as well as professional in terms of making sure that this population of folks doesn't get left behind. So I appreciate your continued leadership. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm taking, I, sorry, my two-year-old is running around upstairs. Um, um, thank you, Commissioner, to all the panelists. And, and I see my dear, dear friend, uh, Anna, on the call as well. So thank you. I don't have a lot of questions. I was taking notes in, in my uh, participation in this hearing is just sort of learning from the panelists where the gaps are and where we can do better um, as a collective to, to close those gaps. And more importantly, um, to make sure that the resources that are available are getting out to our constituents. My biggest neighborhoods are Dorchester and Mattapan. And so I've just a little bit of concern around the uh, access to information um, and making sure that it's being dispersed in an equitable way or in creative ways. And so that was really the gist of, of my participation in, in today's uh, hearing. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. Thanks for being with us. Thank um, you. And thank I'll, I'll you. stay on. I'm staying on. Thank you. Um, I know I mentioned Council Block may not be on. Um, Councilor Kim Janey, City Council President. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. First, I would just like to thank you for your amazing leadership on, on this issue. Uh, you have been a, a strong champion on all things uh, veterans and military affairs. Certainly want to thank the administration for all of your work. Uh, like many of my colleagues interested in understanding the gaps, uh, want to make sure that we are supporting uh, our, our veterans, um, certainly deeply concerned, um, you know, watching uh, not just across the Commonwealth, but across our country as we look at uh, different facilities that are that are serving our vets and, and seeing what they are going through uh, with this pandemic. Um, I, um, I, I, I'm interested in the gaps. I'm also interested in disproportionate impact, as I'm sure you all know, um, uh, you know, African-Americans, Black people, uh, certainly other uh, populations have experienced disproportionate impact when we look at the uh, number of confirmed cases. I wonder if that is playing out uh, among our vets. And if you could uh, speak to that and how we are trying to address that uh, and closing that gap uh, in terms of services. So it's kind of the, the general gaps and how we can be supportive, but also wanting to kind of peel back the onion and understand what is happening uh, when we look at the different uh, demographic groups. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, in the, the other city council that I believe is on, on this call is um, Councilor Anissa Savi george uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you everyone who's here uh, today. I particularly, I appreciate everyone's presence and sort of longevity of experience in this field, not just with your own service, but with the, um, with the, the service of the work that following your own personal service. I'm particularly uh, pleased with the focus that Carolyn was sharing on uh, women veterans. I think that's a, a field that's sometimes often forgotten. So I appreciate that and the um, you know, continued efforts on behalf of everybody. And, and I echo the thanks of, of our chair of this committee, Councilor Ed Flynn, and his work. I'm particularly uh, pleased that there was 
a great showing. Um, I think Commissioner Santiago uh, referenced it earlier in, on the 99th birthday of one of our city's residents in South Boston. What a wonderful way to celebrate a birthday during this difficult time. So uh, like my colleagues here to really learn and listen and understand and, and appreciate that the needs of our veterans are being met in particular during this time. I am curious, I suppose, if anyone has an answer to this question. Um, through, your, through the facilities that you either represent or work with, do you see a similar need to the PPE and access to various equipment the same way we're seeing that in more traditional healthcare facilities? I suppose the VA is a more traditional healthcare facility, but some of these other places where our vets are, um, is, that, is that seen as a significant need as it is in other places? Thank you again. Thank you, um, Councilor Sabi George. And I believe that's, that's all of the city councils I have at this time. Um, if more come on, I will introduce them and recognize them. But at this time, maybe we could um, have our panelists. We also have Anna Richardson from the Veterans Legal Services that does tremendous work on, on veterans and military families. At this time, maybe we can combine the two questions that uh, Councillor Janey and Councillor Sabi George had um, as a start, um, and maybe we could try to answer those. So we can open that up to the panelists, including including Anna as well. Sure, uh, Mr. Chairman, okay. um, Tom Lyons here. Um, and, and again, I think the questions or the concerns that the councillors have are certainly the concerns that those of us in the veterans community have been looking at and talking about. Um, let me just speak a little bit about the Chelsea Soldiers Home because it's it's unique in the sense of well, we, we have uh, close to 200 veterans living in a dorm uh, style environment. And we also uh, have a, uh, a long-term care facility, Quigley Memorial Hospital, and where we have uh, veterans who are right now um, may have dementia, uh, may have issues that um, families are not able to take care of. So uh, what we're doing um, is, uh, particularly with the veterans in the dorm, uh, if, if they move from place to place, wherever they go, we take their temperature, anybody coming onto the campus, uh, uh, delivering um, materials or whatever it may be with taking their temperature. Um, we're a state facility, but we are also in need of the PPE uh, uh, equipment, not only for the people in, in our hospital, but also for the staff who work um, tirelessly uh, with our veterans in our dorm. So I think the same issues that uh, hospitals are looking at, we are looking at uh, uh, on, on campus as well. Um, I don't know the break, the break up of the demographics. Um, um, I'm sorry, Madam President, uh, but, but I do know the veterans who are on our campus, um, as I say, we've lost um, 17 and we're constantly looking at um, uh, 30 or so residents uh, who have tested positive um, but they're isolated and, and we're looking at taking care of them. And we, and we have 52 staff uh, who had tested positive and, and they have been um, uh, staying home, isolated and taking care of themselves. So uh, as a small campus of veterans, we're constantly looking, every day we're looking at making sure those veterans who, who are on site uh, are are taken care of, uh, and as I said earlier, with a donation of 25 iPads, making sure particularly the veterans in the long-term care have, are having a connection with their family. Thank, thank you, Tom. Um, could I ask um, Coleman Nee and then, and then uh, Commissioner Santiago? Uh, Coleman? Sure, uh, thank you, Councillor, and yeah, thank you, uh, excellent questions. Um, you know, there are, um, you know, I know that we're looking to explore what are the gaps in terms of, uh, in terms of getting these services out to individuals. And, uh, and, and, you know, and when we look at specialty populations within the veterans community, 
you know, we do know that there are gaps and in, 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 in difficulties and barriers involved with getting all women veterans in to get services, you know, based on, you know, maybe they, they might or not have had pleasant experiences in the United States military, or they might have, uh, they might be suffering from military sexual trauma or, or, or a survivor from other issues. Uh, we know that, you know, in the LGBTQ plus community, a lot of veterans might not have had a positive experience. And as a result, don't necessarily seek out traditional veteran services when they come out. Uh, and we also know in, in, uh, in the city of Boston that, you know, it's, it's, you have to do very specific outreach in order to reach all veterans, um, and particularly in the African-American and Latinx communities, uh, you know, that, that, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that we're, we're hitting those communities uh, as hard as we can and convincing all of them that, uh, that, you know, that their experiences maybe in the past don't necessarily have to be their experiences in the future. And that it's a very welcoming environment at the Boston uh, uh, you know, Department of Veteran Services, and uh, and and the commissioner has created, and, and and deputy commissioner have created an extremely inclusive environment down there. So uh, we, we one is building that trust back up so that those veterans feel comfortable seeking the services. And the other thing too is just you know the the biggest issue we have in vet services is this, not for lack of benefits, but there's so many benefits spread out over so many different layers uh, mm -hmm. and different governmental systems and different access points that you know you really need a systems navigator in order to help you uh, move through that benefit system and that's where the, again the commissioner dav um i saw bob notch on the line before from bright marine uh carolyn uh, particularly for women veterans can be a, a a strong advocate to help but i would ask all of the counselors and, and your staff that whenever anyone calls you with a constituent problem particularly around finances or housing uh, health care things of that nature Honestly, the first question out of your, you know, you should ask is, you know, did you ever serve in the military? And and if the answer is no, the next question should be, were you ever married to someone, or was your are you a dependent child of someone who ever served in the military? And if the answer is yes to any of those questions, honestly, the next step should be uh, Commissioner Santiago's office. The Chapter 115 benefit is statutorily benefited. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, there's no pool of money that runs out. You, you're, it's a civil right that you have as a result of being a resident of the Commonwealth. And also it's, it can cover everything from immediate financial assistance, uh, uh, you know, provided immediately uh, up to, uh, I think, $2,500, $2,600 for a family. Uh, it covers all of your medical costs, premiums, co-payments, deductibles. Um, you know, it's, uh, it can cover extraneous costs for, you know, uh, everything from a mortgage payment that's in arrears to a, to a you know, broken water heater, or, you know, whatever, that's all that, I, 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 you know, that's kind of dependent upon, uh, you know, whether the state approves uh, those extraneous costs, but, but they are eligible for that. And really, honestly, getting the word out, making sure everyone who's ever worn the uniform or been married to someone who won the uniform, even if that person is deceased, uh, really, you know, getting that information and making sure they have the information that's benefit, to me, I think would go a long way towards closing those gaps. Thank you, Coleman. And before I, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just add to that, you know, one of the areas I think that could be very helpful, particularly with um, uh, the um, widow of a veteran uh, who who may not know that um, they may also be a, uh, be able to take advantage of um, medical as well as the financial. And I think for uh, so many of our elderly. Uh, the medical benefits uh, can go a long way in, in helping them with their quality of life. Thank you, Tom. And before I ask um, Commissioner Santiago and Deputy Commissioner Bishop to speak, um, I had the opportunity to work closely with Rob and, and with Brian on outreach to African-American uh, veterans, uh, veterans in the Latino community and in the LGBT uh, plus community as well. Um, but Rob and Brian and Maya Walsh are doing an excellent job in outreach to our veterans and military families. So I want to say thank you to uh, Maya Walsh. Um, Commissioner Santiago, um, do you want to oh, try thank to you, Councilor uh, uh, Councilor Janey's um, comments? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Councilor Flynn. Thank you, uh, Councilor Janey, for uh, the great question. Um, one of the things that we were doing before we got into this uh, uh, this uh, pandemic emergency was uh, working on an aggressive outreach program. Uh, one of the things that I was doing was having commissioners in different uh, various neighborhoods where uh, where we've noticed that uh, um, 
Uh, it's sometimes it's hard to reach those veterans in those communities. But um, but just to echo on, uh, uh, what uh, what Coleman said, I think it's uh, very important that uh, when a constituent does call uh, your offices, that they that they be asked if they have served in the military. Now, a lot of them, um, depending on how you phrase that, would say yes, yes and no. So the way Coleman phrased it, I think would be the best way to communicate it is, have you ever served in the armed forces? Because there are folks that serve in the armed forces who don't think that they're veterans. So uh, that determination should be made uh, by, by our office, if they're a veteran or not. So by starting out by asking them if they serve in the military, any of the five branches is, uh, is, is, is very important. Um, one of the things that uh, myself and uh, Deputy Commissioner Bishop was also doing prior to the pandemic was individually uh, reaching out to the different organizations and the leadership of those organizations to talk to them, rather it be the African American um, uh, uh, veteran organizations out there that's, that's headed by uh, Haywood uh, Fennell, you know, the Triad Veterans Group. Uh, myself, uh, you know, with Tony Molina and the Puerto Rican Monument Association and those groups, and also the LGBT, the Boston Pride, we were actually going to do a lot of great things with Boston Pride this year, but uh, all that is, is, is being put on hold. So um, one of the things that's great, uh, a, a great partnership that I have right now is with, with Anna, Anna and uh, Legal Veteran Services. Uh, we're trying to get the word out there that Chapter 115 is available for our veterans. Uh, and it's very important that they know that this program has been around since the Civil War. And it's still, uh, it still amazes me that a lot of our veterans and their families don't know that it's there for them. Um, one of the things that we're, gonna, we're, we're doing in the office and um, that is very important to me to also get out there is that we also want to serve those veterans that do not qualify for Chapter 115. So we, we, we're going to have, as part of, our, um, part of our budget, the Boston Veterans Alleviation Fund. So that's, that's, and the goal is to focus on expanding our services and benefits for our veterans and their families. So this is gonna be a very big program uh, for us. So, uh, you know, we're doing everything we can. We're thinking out of the box and uh, trying to be innovative and figuring out ways to, uh, to reach our veterans here in the city of Boston. Um, currently, we have about 17,000. I think that number's higher. So hopefully the census will bring out that number to be where I think it, it, it really is more like about the 20,000 range, but, um, but yet, yeah, yeah, uh, there are a lot of programs out there. And again, uh, it was mentioned, there's a lot of uh, uh, state programs, uh, obviously with Chapter 115, the, um, the Welcome Home bonus as well, and also a lot of federal programs through the uh, uh, Veterans Benefits so, uh, Association, Veteran Benefits Affairs. But, um, and uh, again, uh, by getting to talking to your constituents and trying to identify who the veterans are and their families, we could pass on that information to them and see what they're, what they are, what they, what, what they're able to qualify for. Thank, thank you, Rob. Brian, Brian Bishop. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's it is so great to uh, to be here uh, alongside Commissioner Santiago and this great staff of the City of Boston. Uh, I started my work here, and uh, it's so great to be back and to to actually sit down and really evaluate where we are and where we want to go and the vision and and the leadership of, of the commissioner um is is just spot on right now uh our biggest issue that we have here is outreach and i think uh the uh, uh president janey and and the questions that have been asked here is that how do we get that information out and it's funny because <laughs> the commissioner and i sit literally will sit at the end of a day and say how can we make this better how can we get that word out how can we consistently get the, the motivate? That, that's, I guess that's another thing too, is to motivate people to, um, to ask the questions and, and get if veterans or if they're uh, spouses of veterans or whatever, reach out to us. It's, it's, so, it's, uh, it's amazing that we are an office that very few people know exists. <laughs> uh, and it's just not in Boston. Uh, it, when I was in Somerville, I spent four years in Somerville and still consistently kept telling people, yes, we have a veteran service office. Said, really? How long has that been there? Oh, only about 160 years. Um, but it, it's one of those things where we have to continuously let people know that we exist. And through your work as, as counselors and as advocates out there, continuously tell them that the Boston Veteran Service Office is just not a welfare office for veterans. It is an right. advocacy location that you can come and get information on housing, employment. Um, if, if you want to volunteer, as we've seen through this pandemic, 600 people within the Boston area 
And, and, and that happened within days of Mayor Walsh making that announcement. People come out of the woodwork and say, if you're a veteran, we want to help you. If, or, or if you're a veteran saying, I want to give back. And that is today's veteran. Today's veteran wants to give back. They don't all just want to sit at the post. They want to go out and make a difference in people's lives. And I think our office now has the fire, we have the energy, and we have the desire to go out and make sure that every single veteran in the city of Austin, and speaking with uh, former Secretary Nee, you know, everyone in the Commonwealth, we're the only state in the United States of America who have this program of Chapter 115 of financial assistance. We lead the way, little Massachusetts up here, but yet we make sure that our veterans and their families are not left behind. And as we continue to do that with great leadership and great partners, we're gonna do amazing work. And, and people, uh, all of you who sit on the city council, all of you who sit in public service, all of you who sit in nonprofits, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to give back to our veterans and their family. And I yield back. Th thank you, Brian. And I just wanted to ask um, Anna and Carolyn, um, are we doing enough to make sure our veterans and military families know what services are available, what help is available? And if not, what could we do better? Um, so my name is Anna Richardson. I'm the co-director at Veterans Legal Services. Um, we are a legal aid organization for veterans in Massachusetts. So we can help if you have a veteran who is um, has a court matter like housing, family, debt, accessing any of these benefits that we're talking about, whether it's Chapter 115, VA, SNAP, Mass Health. Um, if you know, Carolyn mentioned veterans who are dealing with domestic violence issues. Restraining mm -hmm. orders are something we can assist with on an emergency basis. Um, historically, we've provided our services on site at locations like the New England Center and Home for Veterans, the Bedford VA, and the Chelsea Soldiers Home um, as part of their kind of wraparound services. And obviously, in the current environment, that's not workable. So um, I will send some follow-up written materials to Mr. Lopez that include a flyer about our virtual services where folks can call in for a consultation. Um, we also have an informational flyer about Chapter 115 that we've been sending out to food banks and other resources. Um, you know, I can't overstate how uh, intrepid and bold and great Boston has been in this moment. Um, you know, Commissioner Santiago and his team back right in, in mid-March, just after social distancing was implemented, proactively reached out to our office to say, here's how to contact us, here's how to let us know if you see unmet needs emerging in this community, um, and here's how we can work together to meet those. And um, this online benefits application is the, the first of its kind for the Chapter 115 program. It's something you know we've been urging for a long time that their office took the lead in implementing in this crisis to be sure that these benefits were available, uh, even if you know a veteran can't walk in to file an application in person, which is historically how this program has been administered. So um, you know, just incredible leadership that's been shown at this level to get the word out um, and to, to broaden access as much as possible that I think has um, you know, led to other communities changing how they're administering the program as well. So that's, that's been greatly appreciated. Um, that said, we can always do more. Um, to speak a little bit to the demographics question, uh, post 9-11, the two fastest growing demographics of veterans are women and people of color. Um, and they historically have had you know, varying needs as compared to their prior generations of, of veteran counterparts. Um, post 9-11 veterans like accessing services in a really different way. So um, that online application is especially key for younger veterans because they are much more internet driven in how they interact with benefits and services. Um, and um, one other resource I just want to be sure to mention while we have everybody on here is the crisis line uh, through VA because I know my staff are seeing a huge number of people calling who are feeling really overwhelmed by what's going on right now. Um, and we're making a lot more referrals to that than we have in the past for suicide prevention and urgent mental health concerns. Um, so that number is 1-800-273-8255. 
Uh, veterans can also interact with a mental health professional over text message if they're not comfortable calling on the phone by texting 838-255, um, and they will get connected with professionals who can assist. So, you know, if you do have someone calling your office in a crisis, that's the, the first thing that we want to address. Um, it's easy to look at how many people we've lost in this pandemic right now. Um, but we've lost 60,000 veterans to suicide in the last decade. So, you know, anything that we can do to reach out, to provide those additional services, support, hope, um, you know, things like the buddy program that Commissioner Santiago implemented um, that add those social interactions and additional psychosocial support are all really, really important. So uh, I just really commend Boston for your leadership on this, uh, but please look to us as a partner. We are here to help. I know the courts are technically closed as far as the courthouses go, but certain business is still happening. Um, and we're seeing things like, you know, people having their utilities shut off by their landlord or illegal lockouts, uh, problems with family, problems with debt collectors. And as we have a new uh, demographic of folks who are eligible for all of these benefits that have not historically accessed them, that presents its own challenge. So, you know, my staff is here to assist with that and we wanna be advocates and partners in helping people access the benefits and services that they've earned. Th thank you, um, thank you, Anna. Uh, Carolyn, would you like to follow up next? Sure. Um, I had a couple of different thoughts as um, folks were, were talking um, about how VA may be a little bit different than some of our city hospitals. Um, I was thinking about the, the need for PPE um, and stresses on the supply. Um, one of the things that VA had, I think has done extremely well, VA Boston in particular, um, is that we activated an incident management team um, has really kept a close eye on all of our resources, including PPE um, and stresses on staff. Um, our employees are like other facilities, very stressed in when you see over and over the, um, the degree of illness and the degree of severity of the cases that come in um, and including including the death of our veterans um, it hits very hard um, we have in particular worked very closely with our regional partners um, for instance we had um, some a team of nurses come down from white river junction which has not seen the same type of surge as we have here in boston um, they came down they've worked in uh, two or three week deployments down here. Um, but even prior to that, when New York City first really started their surge, we've had teams from Boston that went down and served down there. So the mutual support has been really strong. Um, the, the needs that come up, we reach out to our New England partners first. Um, and then we also have our partners from all across the country that are there um, on a moment's notice to help each other. Um, one of the other issues that um, various people have brought up was how do we reach our veterans, particularly, um, particularly isolated um, folks who are maybe financially challenged, um, have food insecurity, um, be in part of a rather marginalized group, such as the LGBTQ community um, and women veterans as a minority in VA. Part of what we've been doing is taking a look at how do we reach out to veterans um, and how do we get messages to them. Um, I know personally in our women veterans program, we've looked at how do we reach out on social media, on the internet, in writing, by telephone. Um, we had a, a mailing that went out uh, Friday to all women veterans that have used VA Boston in the last um, two years that came out from Mr. Ng and myself. Um, and just trying to, trying to keep in mind all the different ways that our veterans communicate 
with us and with their community at large. Um, so it really is continuing to um, to reach out in any way we can think of. Um, I do also want to mention and um, give a lot of appreciation to Bob Notch and the Greater Boston Veterans Collaborative, um, which has been doing weekly summits on veterans resources and needs um, and the collaboration among members of that team um, has been phenomenal. Um, one other community of veterans that I was just thinking about um, that we in Boston have a large number of is the student veteran population. Um, I was really pleased to see um, Veterans Benefits Administration continuing GI Bill benefits to our students during this pandemic, um, is particularly when, when schools are closing and um, trying to figure out how do they provide education online and from where. Um, I think that transformation has been huge and we've talked to a lot of veterans about that, um, that issue. Um, so those are just a few of the, the things that have popped into my mind. Um, if there are any questions, I'm free to um, to answer any others. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, um, Carolyn. And before we open it up to the to the public, if there's any public on on the call, we also have Brian Reeves that is with us from the New England Center in Home for Veterans. I've been working closely with Sheila Dillon, with Rob Santiago, and uh, Marty Martinez. Um, working closely with these with the center but brian are you are you on there with us i am indeed commissioner uh, Br Br hi brian um how how is the center doing um any outstanding issues and how can we be helpful well first of all thanks for inviting us to this and and appreciate everybody's time that's here because we all have a common goal and common interest uh right now that rises above all else um i would say first of all um, I've been, it started out a little rough, but uh, we are getting the PPE we need through the city of Boston, thanks to you and, and to uh, Commissioner Santiago that have been um, taking the time to check in on us. Uh, but through MEMA and through uh, the Boston city government, we've been able to keep up with PPE. And it function, it, it boils down to basically gloves and, and masks right now. It's mandatory in our building that all folks are wearing masks. Um, what we're seeing is a decline in our population because we haven't been filling up the bathtub, so to speak, as quickly because the hoops to get in here are a little more stringent um, because we can't just let anybody in. Um, as you know, we did testing uh, a couple of weeks ago and we're, we're very happy with the, the results of that testing, less than 3% of, of our folks. And so that's rather remarkable and we, we wanna keep it that way and, and knock on wood, it stayed that way. So. Um, we, we can't do it, we couldn't do it without the help of, of the city and state government that is, is getting us through this. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, we're proud of the outstanding work that your center is doing and helping uh, work with homeless veterans and providing excellent job training, housing options, uh, drug treatment programs as well. So uh, thank you to the center. Um, at this time, I'd like to see if there's any anyone from the public that would like to that would like to testify. Um, I'm just going through the list now. Um, Kerry, do we have anyone from the public that's um, here to testify? We don't have anyone in the waiting room, but it'll just be a matter of uh, if you want to testify. Okay, while we wait, I would ask our panelists, we'll probably give um, closing statements. And if our panelists um, wanna give a closing statement, and then at the end, if we do have some public testi testimony, we can take it at the end. But again, wanna say thank you to the leaders, the panelists that are here for your tremendous work in supporting veterans, supporting military families, not only during this pandemic, during this difficult time, but all the time, you're always there fighting for work for uh, veterans and military families. And um, I wanna say thank you. And maybe we'll start off with, with, with Tom. I remember when you, when they 
first dedicated the South Boston Vietnam Veterans Memorial in South Boston. You and several others were, were the founder of it. Um, but at that time, Tom, the, you know, the community, the, the city or the state of the country really didn't welcome Vietnam veterans home. There weren't these services and programs for veterans, but it's people like you that really fought that attitude and made sure today's veterans get the services that they, that they earn. So thank you, Tom. And just want to give you the last, um, the last comments here. Hey, Tommy's on mute. How's that? Can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? Yep. Hey, now, John. Thank you for uh, for that. Yes, we have taken great pride in uh, uh, what we did 39 years ago. But equally, uh, we are as proud that uh, we've gone back to our Vietnam Memorial every year since that dedication in 1981, which speaks to what we did back then was. Uh, a commitment and dedication to remember our friends and 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 also the honor honor the service of the men and women back back then um I thank you for the opportunity uh to be on this panel today uh i, I feel like i'm the elder statesman um have you know, having been involved in the veterans community for uh, so many years but but it's always it's always um heartwarming to know that there are veterans young younger veterans and older veterans who still care about how we take care of our men and women who have served in their family. So thank you for the opportunity and always available if you need me. Thank you, Tom. And um, I'd like to ask Commissioner Santiago, um, again, thank you to the commissioner. Thank you to Mayor Walsh for day one being there for our veterans during this pandemic, but more importantly, for always being there for our military families as well. So um, Commissioner Santiago, do you have any closing, closing comments? Yes, uh, thank you, Council Flynn. Um, yes, and I just want to echo something that you said. Uh, Mayor Walsh has just been fantastic in taking care of our veteran population and their family. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to work for him, but it's also hard to work for him. It's easy because he always tells me, I always ask him for something, he says, you got it. But he's, it's hard in the sense that he tells me, what more can we do? Because there's always more that we could do. So he always keeps me on my, on my toes, which is fantastic. I want to say uh, thank you to both Tommy and Coleman. These have been my mentors. Uh, since I became commissioner, you guys have always made yourselves available for me whenever I need it. Um, either going to breakfast, call me, you. I, we have breakfast meetings, Tommy, we have lunch meetings. So now I'm looking for that third person to have the dinner meeting. So we'll figure that <laughs> out, you know. But, uh, but thank you all, uh, uh, both, especially for your leadership. And, you know, because um, uh, you guys have the corporate knowledge in our veterans community um, here, in, here in Boston and, 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 uh, and, of course, in the state of Massachusetts. So thank you both very much from the bottom of my heart. Um, Anna, you've been great. It's, it's always great working with you. Um, you it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great uh, uh, air relief knowing that there are advocates out there like you and, and wanting to take care of, of our veterans. Um, and Brian, I can't, say, um, I can't say much about what you and Andy have, uh, have done during the New England Center and Home for Veterans. When I uh, called you about how things are going at the, at the center, um, I know I didn't have to worry because they, uh, there's uh, great leaders at the helm over there and you guys are doing a fantastic job. Um, and to the city councilors, thank you all very much for, uh, for, for your leadership and uh, being on the line. Uh, it's great uh, to, to, to see that, uh, that, that uh, city councilors are also very proactive in ensuring that uh, this part of their constituency is taken care of as well. And that my office, of course, is available to you for anything, whether it be Hero Squares, whether it be uh, a housing opportunity or anything, just please uh, get a hold of myself or Brian, who's, uh, who's been great since he's uh, come back from Somerville. I'm very happy that he's back. Uh, when I asked him, you know, uh, um, you know why, why, why do you want to come back to Boston? His response was perfect, because I never wanted to leave to begin with. So um, thank you all. And thank you again, okay. Councilor Flynn, for your friendship and also for your leadership in the City Council on all affairs for uh, military veterans and, uh, and their families. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, finally, I'd like to ask Coleman Nee, and then after Coleman, I'd, I'd like to recognize again my my colleagues from the city council to ask them if they have any final comments as well uh coleman uh, thank you councillor thank you to everyone the commissioner thank you it's uh, it's a real pleasure and honor uh you know working with you and and sir and uh being in the city of boston during this time knowing you're at the helm uh, you and, and brian it's uh 
you know, really uh, the collaborative efforts. We, I don't think we've seen them uh, in, in decades in, in the city of Austin right now to try to get more of these benefits and services out there. So that's a testament to your leadership, the mayors, and really to the city council in terms of even doing these hearings and making sure we get the word out, you know, asking the, uh, the difficult questions about where the gaps are and what we can be doing. Um, you know, I just say uh, at the, uh, at, you know, we, one thing we need to think about what is going on right now and who can we help right now, but we also really need to take some time and think about what does a post COVID-19 world look like and, and particularly for our veterans and their family members. When we come out of this, uh, when we emerge from, from our homes and get back to whatever the new normal is going to be, uh, there is going to be a huge demand for services. Our economy is going to be in very difficult shape. Uh, uh, people are coming out, as Carolyn mentioned, you know, we have people that are, are uh, uh, you know, sequestered right now with, uh, you know, their abusers and, and other people that are, you know, that are, that are um, you know, causing them uh, both physical and, and mental health in, anguish uh, over these past few weeks. We've got people that are coming out that have lost their jobs, that are in financial distress. And, you know, we, we as, as veterans advocates really need to be ready to serve all of these folks. I know the DAV is thinking about it. I know all of my uh, counterparts here on the line are thinking about it. Commissioner, I, I just, I think you're going to be, you're, you and your shop are going to be really busy and we're going to do our best to, 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 to keep the customers coming in to, to come and see you because, you know, we do recognize a lot of people are going to need help after this. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, it's on all of us, uh, elected, appointed, uh, uh, you know, officials and, and uh, individuals in the community and advocates uh, to recognize that and to, to be ready to step up and meet that challenge. So. Thanks for getting the ball rolling on this, Councilor Flynn. Thank you all the uh, uh, the other councilors, Madam President. Um, and with that, uh, I'm done. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Coleman. And at this time, I want to open it up. Um, I want to open it up to my uh, my colleagues um, from the City Council to give closing remarks. I know a couple of them have to leave soon. Um, could I start? Could we start with Councilor uh, President Cheney? Okay, maybe Councilor Janney's not on yet. We'll give her another minute. But in the, in the meantime, Councilor Campbell. Um, thank you, Councilor Flynn. And, um, and thank you to all of the panelists. I, I have a team member who's also participating in, in taking notes to make sure we're giving resources out. But I, I, I just wanna thank the commissioner again and, and Brian and, and Commissioner, your, Brian, Commissioner and your team um, and on all of the f volunteers who've stepped up to really serve. Um, it's been remarkable in the sense that when we do have issues coming up, and I think Coleman said it right, when we have people calling, constituents calling, I feel like I'm running a call center out of my home, um, to be able to go to your office commissioner and to get immediate resources and, and access to information is, is just fantastic. Um, we can't say that for every issue, frankly, and sometimes we have to navigate on the state side and that can be a little bit more challenging. So I, I really appreciate you guys today. I appreciate you, Councillor Flynn, of uh, raising up these issues um, and also uh, providing some expertise um, on the panel. Um, and lastly, just something that really resonated with me um, and it's something that Anna said and that I think connects to what Coleman is saying, which every conversation we're having is always, we're looking now in the immediate and the short term what we can do, but looking forward, right? What do we do uh, with all of these inequities that we're seeing in particular, or all of the issues that existed for us, depending on what your expertise is. Um, and one particular issue is the suicide piece um, that Anna brought up that the silver lining, I hate to say opportunity, but the silver lining in some of this is that maybe this is the time that we exert such uh, action um, on some of these issues that these issues are no longer issues. Um, and the suicide piece I thought was critically important that, that, um, that it was raised on this call because it's veterans of course dealing with mental health issues, but it's whole communities that are dealing with some of the mental health components that we're seeing um, that we need to do I think a little bit more. And so just having those hotline numbers, um, places to text. Um, I was just actually uh, on a call in between, I had to jump off for a couple minutes, jump back on, but related to some of the domestic violence cases that are real um, and really unsettling. Um, so I, I uh, appreciate uh, the raising up of issues that I think you guys have been grappling with 
for a while and, and consider me a partner in the work. But when we come out of this, really roll, rolling up our sleeves and saying we're not going back, um, we're not going to be talking about the same issues in five or 10 years, this is the time to, to do something a little bit different. So thank you guys all for your tremendous leadership um, and hope you and your families, of course, stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Commissioner Flynn, for your leadership as well. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. And it's, it's an honor really to uh, work closely with all my colleagues who have excellent records in support of uh, veterans and military families. All, all of the city councilors I'm proud to work with on, especially on this issue. Uh, Councillor Sabi George, will you, do you have final, final comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to everyone who participated today. It's um, certainly, I think, uh, this hearing has presented an opportunity for you all to share some of your work uh, that I know uh, through my travels across the city as an at-large counselor don't um, don't seem to ever end. So I just, you know, on behalf of all of us, and um, I think I echo my colleagues in just thanking you for your work on behalf of all of our residents, because really by extension, you're not just helping the veteran, and many of you have referenced the services that are there available to the family of, of the veteran. Um, so by doing that, you certainly support our communities um, and our residents and their families in tremendous ways, and, and not just in times of crisis, uh, certainly in times of every other day. And I, I think it was Coleman that maybe mentioned the sort of post-COVID era. We think about everything that we do as a city, we have to make sure that these conversations in depth aren't just happening during a time of crisis, because we know that your members do often deal with the, with the crisis and not just related to their veteran service and to, the, to their service to this nation, but as it relates to um, the crisis that any resident might, might experience. And in particular, it's sometimes an amplified experience due to the impacts of military, impacts of military service. So um, thank you very much for your time with us today. And thank you to Councillor Flynn for, for leading this effort um, and championing, championing the experience of our veterans and their uh, families across our city. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Asabi George, and thank you for your leadership as well. Um, I don't believe that there's any more city councilors on. Um, Councillor Janey, I don't believe is on. Um, so I'll just like to, conclude by saying thank you to the panelists and for the um, for your tremendous work on this issue. I want to say thank you to Commissioner Santiago and his team, uh, Mayor Walsh and Tom Lyons and, and Anna and Coleman and uh, the New England Center and the VA Women's Program. Um, we're proud to have such a, a wonderful group of people working together advocating for veterans, advocating for military families. I was talking to Rob uh, Santiago the other day, and we were talking about when a veteran serves, so doesn't their family. And it's critical that we continue working hard to getting these services and programs uh, benefits that these veterans earn. So our, our city of Boston Veterans Department is in excellent shape uh, under the leadership of Commissioner Santiago and, 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 and Mayor Walsh. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. I look forward to talking to you soon. Um, maybe we'll have another working session, um, maybe, in, maybe in 30 or 60 days, but I will keep you posted. Again, want to say thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being here. And on behalf of all the veterans and Massachusetts, thank you for your help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman also like to recognize and say thank you to um, CENTAF that are working behind the scenes. They did an excellent job in doing the So again, um, thank you to the, thank you to Central for making this a possibility. This meeting is, thank this meeting is concluded. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.